Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Net Zero Investment Lab Public and Private Collaboration on Accelerating Green Investment in Small Island Developing States. I will be your moderator for this session. I really encourage all of you to keep your mics muted um, until you are invited to speak. Those of you who have questions or would wish to make interventions during our interactive session can do so using the text feature in Zoom. SIDS have come a very long way in accelerating their transition to renewable energy and to establish their energy security, but there's still an incredible amount of work left to do and significant opportunities to be seized to accelerate energy transformation in SIDS especially in the challenging context of the recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic. As well, SIDS have taken full responsibility for leading this transition and for increasing ambition towards a clean and renewable energy future. But the current situation is that SIDS receive less than 2% of total climate finance. Foreign direct investments in SIDS landlocked developing countries, LDCs, only account for 2.5% of the global total. And private sector investment flows to 31 markets classified by, by the World Bank as low income countries simply represents a mere 0.1% of total clean energy investments from 2009 to 2018. The multilateral development banks who can help mobilize private sector finance, mobilize less than $1 from the private sector for every $1 of MDB climate finance. This really needs to change. This needs to change urgently. It needs to um, change as we recover from the pandemic, but equally important as we seek to address the climate crisis. In my role as the Assistant Secretary General for Climate Action, um, supporting the UN Secretary General, um, we have prioritized, or the Secretary General has prioritized, really securing a breakthrough on adaptation, as well as a breakthrough on finance that benefits the small island the developing states and the least developed countries. And he's made a number of concrete acts to G7 countries and other donors. One, a doubling of public climate finance, um, a doubling of grants, because as we know, grants can help to facilitate the mobilization of large scale sources of finance um, based on the latest OECD figures. Grants as a proportion of the total of climate finance stood at $12 billion a year. In a report commissioned by the Secretary General, he's asked for this to be double um, in order to meet the, the $100 billion commitment. And he's also asked donors and the MDBs to increase the share of climate finance allocated to adaptation and resilience to at least 50% of total climate finance flows. But you've not come here this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending on your time zone, to hear me. We have an extremely impressive um, set of colleagues who will speak to the topic of private sector collaboration to accelerate green investments in small island developing states. We will of course start with our host, our leader, Francesco La Camera, Director General of IRENA, followed by Nigel Topping, who's the high level champion for COP26. Francesco, the floor is yours, my friend. Thank you, Salvin. Thank you, my friends. And uh, for also for moderating today's discussion and make you waking up very early uh, this morning. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to, to the event. I wish at outset to thank the high-level climate champions, Mr. Nagel Toppings and Mr. Gonzalo Minos for organizing this event with, uh, with ARENA. I think our friendship is strengthening 
the capacity to impact of, uh, of our work. I also wish to thank and welcome all the Seeds Lighthouses initiative partners who are joining us today. Seeds have been instrumental in advancing the global uh, climate agenda, despite having least contributed to it. Their vision and leadership have been crucial in raising global ambition in accelerating renewable energy deployment. As we navigate our way through the global health crisis, SITS continue to lead with resolving pushing forward the energy transition agenda as an integral part of sustainable recovery efforts and climate action. The steadfast commitments of SITS are well reflected in their first round of a national determined contribution, which I currently predict will add 5.2 gigawatt of additional installed renewable energy capacity by 2030. This is more than double the current installed capacity. In relative terms, since its first announces their NDC's renewable energy target in 2015, their renewable energy capacity would have increased by more than 270% by 2030. This against a global increase of 76%. The international community must recognize these efforts and support it further into the future. To take the energy transition in SIS to the next level, it is important to take an holistic approach beyond the power sector. It is essential to leverage synergies between renewables and other sectors, such as food, water, and health, as well as economic growth, poverty alleviation, and sustainable development. This is also an integral part of a resilient and sustainable economy recovery from the pandemic. The cities have continued committed to transferring the key sector to ensure they meet the 1.5 goal including ambition toward 100% renewables energy target. But a major barrier to this has been access to affordable financing. It has been identified by SEEDS always as a key obstacle. To match the level of ambition set in the first round of NDCs, our analysis showed that SEEDS will need to attract a total of 17 billion US dollar of investment by 2030. ARENA has been scaling up efforts to facilitate renewable energy investment in SEEDS. The Climate Investment Platform is an initiative by ARENA, UNDP, and C4ALL in cooperation with the Green Climate Funds, whose main objective is to mobilize investment for the energy transition. ARENA is implementing CFP through investment forums which aim to strengthen the ability of decision makers to improve the enabling environment for renewable energy investment and help developers prepare bankable projects with access to affordable finance. We are planning to organize investment forum in the Pacific and the Caribbean as soon as the condition allow us to do so. Gurbus Kunur, director of our country engagement and partnership division will shortly provide more details of the mechanism of the CFP. I hope today's event will provide insight on how governments, international funding institutions, and the private sector can cooperate to improve the investment environment in SEEDS. Our coordinated efforts is key to stimulate the much needed shift in the energy economy that will ensure a sustainable, resilient, and climate safe future for SEEDS. Let me extend a final thanks to you to to the speakers and all the friends I see too many familiar faces in, in the list of speakers and accepting this invitation, to accept this invitation. I'm looking forward to a fruitful discussion. Thank you for your attention. And back to you, Selvin. Thank you so much, Francesco, um, for your leadership, um, for your um, guidance. Um, I, I note um, that in your intervention, you made the point about access to finance, which remains a critical challenge for the small island developing states and that it will only take, um, a, according to your um, 
analysis, 17 billion um, in mobilized resources by 2030, um, if SIDS are to meet their um, um, Paris nationally determined contributions. And, and, and this 17 billion represents really a mere fraction of the trillions that have been mobilized thus far um, during the course of this pandemic by many of the rich economies. Um, so there's really no excuse really um, for um, much greater focus and attention to the six. I now turn the floor over to my um, friend, Nigel Toppin, the COP26 high level champion on climate action. Nigel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Selwyn. Um, good morning or good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Also, thank you to Francesco. Um, you know, it's been it, it, it working working um, alongside Gonzalo as the other high level champion to um, really try and really align all of our plans with Selwyn, with you and your team, but also with Francesco and the great Irina team. I mean, Elizabeth has been a, a, a hugely important part of the Marrakesh partnership, this big community that we work with, taking the lead on power systems transformation. So it's a joy to join you here. You know, though, for those who don't know, the High Level Champions mandate is to work with um, businesses, investors, cities and regions to drive climate action and ambition. Um, and in Madrid, the parties to the um, Climate Convention asked us to look at how we could improve the impact of that work. And we've had a very strong message from the parties that one way to do that will be to build better links between that sort of private sector, non-state actor work and the state actor work. So we've, we've launched the race to zero, um, which we've heard about earlier, but we've also launched the race to resilience. And I think both those races are very, very relevant to the small island um, community. So I'm really thrilled to join you here. I'm mainly in learning mode. Um, but I, I would say that we, we're very clear that SIDS have a crucial place in the climate change um, landscape, both, both because of the unique vulnerability to the adverse effects of climate change, but also to the, um, the outsized voice on, on, in the climate negotiations and on, 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 on climate change generally. So um, I, I've, I've been really impressed to see the commitments of SIDS to transition economies to low carbon. I really agree with Francesco. We need to make sure we're talking power, yes, but beyond power to um, other sectors. Um, and we need to make sure we're talking about um, uh, mitigation and adaptation, um, given the challenges and, and doing whatever we can to support th that ambition landing up in, in new NDCs. Um, I, I've been really welcome the fantastic work that IRENA have been doing on, on SIDS. Um, when Elizabeth explained it to me, it was something that we had in mind that there needed to be more done. And it's always good when you have an idea and you find someone's had it before you is, and has done a lot of the work. So I think the SIDS Lighthouse Initiative supporting SIDS in their transition is a great idea. And um, what we're really looking to do, Francesco and, and Selwyn and everybody, is see how we can use the platform of the champions to maybe help um, make that go even faster. Noting that already you've been beating targets and that the five gigawatt goal for 2023 was met many uh, four years earlier I, I understand um so um but one of the one of the things is selwyn has really highlighted is the is the lack of flow of capital so the big question we have is what could be done in a in a more collaborative way to unlock more private capital to meet those levels which as francesco says they're big numbers for any individual but at the level of <laughs> the number of countries that are in the SIDS, those are relatively small numbers of amounts of capital that need to be deployed um so um that's the kind of what we offer the way the ambition loop what is it that governments can do to make it possible for private sector to be more ambitious which in turn can make it possible for um, governments to be more ambitious so that's what we're really looking to explore um we do have really good momentum um, in the race to zero we have now over 2,000 businesses committed to the Race to Zero. Just yesterday, another 43 asset managers joined the Race to Zero. So we now have $32 trillion of assets under management. There must be some of that that is deployable in the small island states, right, as part of their commitment. So trying to find that. Um, and, and, and we've just announced the first um, round of initiatives in the Race to Resilience. And, and the, the number that I have in mind um, when we're talking about um, investment in um, small island states and, 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 and LDCs is that the 100 billion, which is a commitment which must be met, and I know that um, Alok Sharma is working very hard to make sure that, that is one of the deliverables for COP26, is 
an enabler which is dwarfed by that figure of four trillion, which is what is needed according to the World Bank to be spent um, every year in emerging and developing economies on um, mitigation and adaptation. So what's, what we're really talking about is how do we leverage um, the, the limited amount of public funding, which even if it was doubled, would not get nowhere near that four trillion. And of course, that's one of the reasons why the UK COP26 presidency is holding a climate and development ministerial meeting tomorrow with the aims of exploring and identifying the practical steps that countries can take together with key multilateral organizations and the private sector to support the delivery of the Paris Agreement and the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development in the world's most climate vulnerable countries and communities. And of course, um, several SIDS are involved tomorrow, which is why we thought this would be a really good time to do a deeper dive with you on how to accelerate green investment in the SIDS. Uh, I'm look, really looking forward to hearing the perspective of small island um, developing states on this topic today and to hearing from the private sector because it's and finance experts because it's that it's that collaboration that we're really trying exploring to see how we can unlock it together to catalyze further investment. I hope that through this meeting we will be able to agree on the importance of accelerating green investments in the STIDs and start thinking through the concrete steps of how to unlock further progress. Maybe we can even think about what we might be able to deliver if we're really bold um, on the stage in Glasgow to signal a step change in the rate of investment. I would just end by reflecting on the terrible tragedy that the COVID pandemic has brought across the world and how this has deeply impacted many SIDS, especially because of the economic prominence of the tourism industry in many small island countries. But this is now an opportunity for us all collectively to seize um, a moment of global solidarity for a global green recovery to the pandemic. Uh, in the run up to COP26 in Glasgow this year, I really hope that we can find together an opportunity for green investment in the SIDS across multiple sectors, as Francesca says, to be a way of demonstrating to the world how we can come together in, a, in, in this new multilateralism that the Secretary General talks about. So countries and the private sector and subnational governments coming together to drive the transformation and to reap the benefits of the low carbon and resilient development that we know is the only way to grow our economies um, and to develop our communities in the 21st century. Thank you, Selwyn, back to you. Thank you so much, Nigel, for your very um, insightful comments. I definitely share your view that the recovery from the pandemic, it represents a once in a generation opportunity um, really for all of us to, to rebuild our economies um, in a low carbon climate resilient way. Um, this is definitely true for the small island developing states and all of us, we look forward um, to tomorrow's climate and development ministerial. Um, this is a really great initiative by, um, by the COP president designate Alok Sharma. Um, we really support his really strong leadership. And one of the themes at tomorrow's climate and development ministerial will be access to finance. And we hope to see real progress on this issue as we head towards COP26. I now turn the floor over to um, my very, very good friend and colleague. I haven't seen her in a very, very long time. Ambassador Diane Black Lane, um, who is the chair of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States, who will give her keynote remarks. Ambassador Black Lane, the floor is yours. Thank you, Salwin, and nice seeing you. Um, mm -hmm. Hope to see you over the next some more over the next few years. Um, yeah, so thank you to Irina for having me here to make this um, the, these few remarks, and I want to start the remarks by saying that one of the main reasons that we're sitting here, just like with COVID and others, is that we have an industry, if we focus only on the energy industry, that is represent one a spectacular example of how we can have the market failing. It's one of those industries that started off with good intentions, one of those industries that started off and, and showed the benefits of global economic development. And then for some reason, it got out of hand. Uh, we have now um, developing so much cash that we are buying weapons and we have wars. 
we are creating climate change, we are, clean, we are creating um, all kinds of problems um, related to this particular industry. And one of the things that we don't talk about much, we, talk, we know about all of these things, is that even with all of that, um, huge population of the world still cannot get access to the energy market. So the energy market in terms of the private sector investment is uh, the only way I could invest or somebody in Antigua could invest is if you buy shares in an oil company or go to the um, stock market. If you're from an island, you don't have access to the stock market really. And so in terms of all of this wealth that is being generated from the uh, fossil fuel industry, um, you're getting all the results of it, but you're not benefiting from the wealth of it. And for, for all sense and purpose, it is almost like a concentrated monopoly of, an, of, a, of a sector. And as we're transitioning, as we're looking towards the transitioning of the sector, one of the things that we're all thinking about is how can we transition to renewable energy and end up with the same type of product? We want to have the same system. And we want to same to have the, the same bankable projects. We want to have the same program attached to the grid. And we want to have the same system um, with respect to transportation and vehicles. And slowly but surely, we're realizing that that may not be possible. And for many persons in the island state, for, uh, for, for AOC's countries, one of, the, one of the things we're seeing emerging from a transition, which is also encouraging us to transition, is that, wait a minute, this gives us an opportunity for all of us now to get into the business of energy in a way that, you know, it's a small business. It's not a global monopoly that is creating opportunity, uh, creating havoc. And this could be something that we're also seeing with respect to, um, with respect to, the opportunities going forward. However, we want to include the private sector. And one of the reasons why um, AOSIS and other countries are struggling with respect to um, getting moving, we're seeing an inertia in the development. We're seeing an inertia in the, in the way that we are moving ahead in the negotiations. And what is the issue with this inertia? When we speak to our ministers and our prime ministers, one of the big reasons is that they can't see the pathway for financing. Now, in many small island developing states, we are seeing that um, we only have access to a limited amount of instruments. So I hear Selwyn talk about grants, which is great, but even if you double the amount of grant, it's still not enough for us. But small island developing states are great at programming loans and we're great at only programming loans. We're not great at using equity. We're not great at using guarantees. Our Ministry of Finance don't have a guarantee unit or equity unit. They have a debt management unit. So we're a great consumer of loans. Um, that product that is put out by the World Bank and other banks and, and governments and bilateral, we're great at that. But we can't program other instruments. If we're going to do a transition, we have to diversify the instruments that are available to small island developing states or else we're going to be, what would happen is that we open the floodgate for this transition and all, everything is great. We open up the markets of the small island developing states and everything is great. But then the countries are going to be pushed to buy a certain technology, pushed to use a certain um, instruments. And that will then, you, even if you have a debt forgiveness program, which I know Selwyn and his team is pushing well at the UN and thank you for that which is gonna get back into a significant amount of debt again. So what if it's debt to build a bridge or to build a school or to build a hospital or to build wind turbines or solar panels, it's still debt and it all needs a sovereign guarantee. So one of the issues that we want to, if you're looking at how that the developed country or large country mobilize their private sector, not only to put projects in their own countries, but they mobilize their private sector to benefit from um, markets in other countries, they don't use loans, they use a, a suite of other instruments, including loans, or they don't use just loans. And so we have to diversify the range of options available to smaller developing states, or we're going to transition and the people in the countries themselves do not get the benefit that they need to, um, that they can invest themselves. So if the local people in the islands are not benefiting from the investment, why should I transition? I'm not creating, any greenhouse gases to create any problems in the world, why transition? So 
Then we have the transitional risk that we all have to kind of keep in mind. Transitional risk, including um, not transitioning our people. Our greatest asset in the islands are our people. They're gonna get left behind. So they're gonna be our greatest stranded asset. How can we convince our people and our prime ministers and politicians that we're not gonna strand our human beings and we, they're going to be replaced by other persons um, coming into the country? Um, and then the other issue that we have to think about for all of us, where is the inertia? We're seeing huge transition occurring in many developing countries. And we're seeing that the, the old engines that have been developing, the old technology being developed, the technology that we see in five to 10 years will become obsolete, maybe like LNG and so on, is being pushed onto developing country. So we are dumping those old technology into developing country and it's creating a leakage situation. And so many of our countries don't want secondhand technology, we want advanced technology. So we are looking forward to AOSIS to design a system and we're saying forcefully to the whole world, we don't want the old stuff. We want to transition our economy. We want to do it well. And we want to be able to manage our risks just like any other country, understand what those are. And we would like our private sector with the little money that we have to opportunity us to benefit from this transition as well. Um, so this is, if we can guarantee that to many AOCs country and many other countries that are LDCs as well, I believe that the transition will be much more easier. We need to start the conversation. We're in implementing mode. We need to start the conversation from that perspective. We're not setting greenhouse gas targets already. We already know what those are. Even if we don't formally set them, we know what they are. We need to have an implementation mode language. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Always a pleasure to see you and definitely looking forward um, to working with you over the coming um, months in your capacity as chair of um, AOSIS. And you made um, some really excellent points on the opportunities um, and some of the challenges. I can agree with you more that we need to switch to implementation mode, including looking at um, the full range of instruments that can be deployed in the small island developing states to um, to accelerate this energy transition. Of course, um, taking into account the needs to um, pay special attention to peoples and communities that will be negatively and adversely impacted from the transition to a clean energy future. And I really would encourage um, many of the colleagues who will come, um, who um, are on the program, um, who will speak from different perspectives, really to, to address the central question that Diane raised. How can we deploy um, um, and act, how can we deploy a range of instruments, make many of them relevant to the situation of the small island developing states? How can we use this range of instruments really to mobilize resources and accelerate this transition to a net zero future? Our next presenter will be from Irina, the Director of Country Engagement and Partnerships. Um, Gerbos Gunul, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Salvin. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and very warm welcome uh, and greetings from uh, Abu Dhabi. Ladies and gentlemen, um, SITs have been at the center of IRENA's focus uh, since the early days of the agency, and we have been cl closely working with them in accelerating their energy transition in support of their climate and sustainable development uh, objectives. SITs Lighthouses Initiative provides the overall framework of our engagement in this respect. And today, uh, I'll be pleased to provide a snapshot of uh, the Lighthouses work not only to strengthen the investment environment for renewables, but also to support the realization of uh, projects. Um, the Lighthouses Initiative, um, it provides a broad umbrella for technical support to facilitate um, uh, SIT's climate action uh, through energy transformation, including to work in the context of um, NDC uh, enhancement and implementation. We have today uh, 36 SITs uh, signed up to uh, SITs Lighthouse Initiative, but also we have uh, 30 development partners 
um, working to support uh, the SIDS um, in, their, um, uh, in the achievement of their ambitions. Such technical support has been made available for years now on a wide range of policy, regulatory and technology areas, as well as for capacity building tailored to uh, policymakers, utilities, regulators and financial institutions um, as relevant. We also support our uh, six member countries in project facilitation, uh, making bankable um, um, uh, project proposals and helping them access affordable finance. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, further elaborate on this point later on. Next slide, please. Um, Irina has been um, regularly consulting with the Lighthouse's partners. Um, their input obtained through uh, consultative discussions helped us uh, identify priority areas for the initiative's next phase of implementation, where action is now going beyond only power sector, but to cover transportation and end use sectors, focus uh, expanding to address resilience and disaster recovery dimension, looking into opportunities in geothermal and ocean energy technologies, but also um, particular emphasis, emphasis is placed on project facilitation support um, on the ground. Um, let me put uh, additional emphasis on the last point, which is most relevant for the purpose of the meeting, obviously, because Light, uh, Lighthouse's initiative is uh, focused on substantially uh, increasing the flow of renewable energy investments into SIS, and this has been routinely highlighted as a crucial area of intervention by the SIS leaders uh, during our uh, events. Um, and we know by now uh, that in order to achieve the renewable energy deployment targets, set even in the first nationally determined contributions, SIS will need to attract uh, around 17 billion US dollars by 2030, which is a um, very uh, ambitious target. Next slide, please. Um, IRENA has been active in the space uh, through our cooperation with Abu Dhabi Fund for Development under a dedicated uh, financing facility, um, which extended uh, funding for several SITS projects um, um, in different areas uh, for a total of 180 million uh, uh, megawatt of um, uh, capacity additions. Uh, but also, which also corresponds to um, 200 million dollars of, of investment. Next slide, please. Um, we are now trying to scale up these efforts. Uh, last year, um, uh, we have consolidated uh, multiple project facilita facilitation services into a dedicated institutional space for project facilitation. We have even created an, uh, a brand new uh, dedicated division to manage this work stream at IRENA. Um, before we uh, further develop on this, I think just a word of uh, clarification. Um, as you know, IRENA is not an implementing agency. Therefore, we are not directly involved in project implementations. Nevertheless, we work with right partners using their different strengths in a complementary manner to facilitate the materialization of the of projects. And, and we receive requests um, uh, from uh, through multiple channels. Those requests, some, some of the requests come directly from member countries, some through UNDP, through our cooperation um, uh, under Climate Promise Initiative, but most recently through the Climate Investment uh, Platform. Next slide, please. Um, our ongoing collaboration with UNDP, um, SC for All, and uh, Green Climate Fund under the uh, Climate Investment Platform, um, it provides a broader framework for the agency's project facilitation support services. And uh, this aims at accelerating investment in renewable energy with a view to contributing to the realization of the ambitious NPCs also. Um, in this effort, uh, IRENA teams up with governments, financial institutions, project developers, and the private sector in developing solid project pipelines backed by the governments, assisting in bringing project proposals to bankability, but also facilitating their access to uh, finance. Next slide, please. Um, from early next year, um, the implementation of climate investment platform will be further supported through the uh, investment forums that we plan to organize in, in 14 geographic clusters, including um, uh, Caribbean and Pacific, 
And with this, uh, we want to offer an effective fora for enhanced government investor dialogue, dedicated project matchmaking support and associated capacity building activities. And we are very much looking forward to organizing dedicated investment forums for Caribbean and the Pacific uh, as soon as um, uh, conditions all, uh, on the ground are conducive to, uh, to that. Next slide, please. And um, let me finally um, share a few numbers on the CIP implementation um, so far. And this is the global uh, spread of um, 208 projects registered through the CIP. And out of those, um, 10 of them um, are located in SITS, um, which seek support for, uh, for uh, bringing their proposals to uh, bankability. And we are lately uh, intensifying our efforts to, do, to uh, further develop the, the pipeline um, in the SITS and um, working with the governments, but also directly with the private sector. And this, um, the um, requests here so far, they were on the uh, re related to bankability improvement. And those assessments uh, undertaken by IRENA, they cover various dimensions, uh, looking into uh, technology uh, dimension, uh, financial viability, sustainability, environmental, social impact, as well as the alignment with the national ambitions, especially uh, set through the NDCs. So thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for your presentation, um, as well as um, your update on the work of the climate, um, on the climate um, investment platform, um, which is one of the initiatives launched at the, um, the, the um, climate summit of the Secretary General in 2019. And um, we're really happy to see how um, this has um, progress. Um, we definitely would love to see it move even faster and um, but but nevertheless um, th this this is some really good work and I really would encourage those SIDS that are listening um, ministers and policymakers in small island developing states to reach out um, directly to you um, to see um, if they can participate in this exciting initiative. We now move to the private sector to get a private sector perspective. Um, we move to the managing director of MPC Renewable Energies. Martin, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Mr. Hart. Um, good morning, everyone. And many thanks also to Irina for inviting us uh, here today to, to share our experience uh, as a private sector player that has um, tremendous experience also on the small island, um, in particular in the, in the Caribbean region. Um, second, I would like to say that Ambassador Black Lane, I think mentioned already all the very critical points um, that, that, needs discussed, that needs to be discussed among the private and the public um, sector in order to accelerate the growth of the energy transition in these um, islands. Next slide, please. So just a few words about MPC Energy Solutions. We have uh, founded this company as a developer, operator, and owner of sustainable energy solutions um, with a very strong focus on emerging markets and initially with a very strong focus on the um, Caribbean basin region. So we develop, finance these assets, build them, and are the long-term owner and operator. We have listed this company on the Norwegian Stock Exchange because there we find a, a environment with a very strong affinity of institutional investors that indeed would like to support the energy transition and the impact of climate change in the emerging market uh, environment. So our shareholders in the companies are predominantly Scandinavian based insurance firms, pension funds uh, and other institutional investors. Next slide, please. So here to, to show you a little bit our regional exposure um, to the small islands uh, in the Caribbean basin. MPC is active in the region now since 2015 already. And in the last six years, we became a leading stakeholder um, in the energy sector um, in the Caribbean basin. We have mobilized so far about $150 million of 
capital purely from the private sector. Um, I think we can be very proud about um, that without the involvement of any public entity, without, without any taxpayer money, without any blended finance support. The money and the capital that is also being raised among the regional institutional investors, and I think this addresses very important aspect of Ambassador Black Lane that says basically the energy transition is also an opportunity to democratize the energy supply in the region and to change from the existing monopolistic structures towards a ownership structure that also enables local participation and local um, ownership. And we have uh, encouraged and supported that um, from the very early um, start. I think MPC is, is one of the um, very few, if not the only company that has cross-listed on the Jamaican and the Trinidadian Stock Exchange change a company in order to give the local people the ability to subscribe and buy this um, share um, that invests only in the regional energy transition and in clean energy investments, as in most of these areas, it is not possible um, to you know, participate otherwise on these projects. In this sense, uh, I can also really only encourage the idea of a single stock exchange uh, in the region uh, in order to further nurture this kind of opportunity for the local um, people to participate in the local uh, energy transition. Next slide, please. Yeah, why is uh, MPC also supporting uh, this trend? We see here very strong support from the local uh, governments. Um, a lot of the local governments have understood that they can only um, realize their renewable energy targets uh, by engaging the private sector. I think this is, of course, the key understanding that the private and the public sector works hand in hand. First of all, you need to manage the expectations. What do we expect from each other? when it comes to, to making investments in the energy transition locally. Um, of course, we are depending as a private sector entity in a highly regulated segment, the energy market, to have the right regulation and regulatory framework in place in order to even allow us to enter the local market. And furthermore, of course, there needs to be a um, support during the implementation phase um, of the projects. And I can only share that there is a huge difference among the public stakeholders um, in the region of how to, how to work with the private sector. And Jamaica, for instance, um, I think have clearly demonstrated to be very successful uh, in working with the private sector and implementing um, renewable energy projects in the markets. And I think um, this can also really be seen from other governments as a role model, how to attract this foreign investment without drawing further loans um, also from, from institutions, which at the end doesn't put the government in a better position at all. Next slide, please. And what we see is also really that the energy transition provides an opportunity to unlock economic growth and green recovery in the region. The reason for that, as you all know, the energy prices based on the outdated thermal technologies that are being used to generate power in the region are not just causing um, ecological harm, but they are also um, generate power at very, very high prices. As you see, the, the SITs in particular in the, in the Caribbean region are suffering under very high um, retail prices, but also for industrial consumers that puts the local manufacturers at a competitive disadvantage. It also um, has the issue that a lot of the corporate producers have no access to low carbon intensive energy. They have no access to reliable power supply. So with renewable energy, we really are at a moment um, in history where we can change this um, to the better again. And whenever there is a investment decision to be, to be made about new capacities to be installed um, with a drop of levelized cost of energy for renewable energy, it is clearly um, an opportunity to diversify also away from the existing um, structures, um, generation structures, but also ownership structures, um, and also to decentralize the energy generation, because this is the greatest opportunity within renewable energy. You do not rely on a single power plant per island anymore, where you have a very vulnerable um, transmission grid. 
but you can really decentralize the energy supply towards the consumption centers. And with that, as we all know, the Caribbean is also very vulnerable against adverse weather, create a more resilient energy infrastructure. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, and um, just uh, last but not least, um, showing you what, what can happen if the public and the private sector works well together. This is the 51 megawatt Paradise Park project uh, in Jamaica, um, where we have also worked on the community engagement um, together with the Clinton Foundation. Um, we have worked very well with the local utility JPS, which in these micro ecosystems that is a small island, it is also very important to consider the other local stakeholders uh, in the energy market. And this project was very strongly promoted um, by the Jamaican um, government, not just by setting the right regulatory framework when it came to designing um, the auction process and the, and the power purchase agreements, but also later on when it came to um, implementing the projects on all lower levels of the administration where you are working to get the permits, to get your contracts and agreements in place, we can say that um, this, I think, was uh, very much um, the best case scenario that you could have in, 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 this, in building a large um, solar farm in one of these um, islands. Next slide, please. Yeah, we can skip this. It's just another project. And with that, um, to the next slide and final slide, Thank you for your attention. Um, 10 minutes were incredibly short, but very happy to uh, answer all of your questions later on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martin. Um, I was really hoping that you would say a lot more um, about um, Paradise Park, um, uh, especially in terms of the um, what it has what you've been able to done to, to um, sort of revolutionize um, the production of energy in Jamaica. Can you just for um, a few seconds tell us um, the, um, how much you, you have been able, the cost of um, per kilowatt hour of generating electricity um, from the Paradise Park? Yeah, so um, we have achieved to install the solar park um, with a power purchase agreement of eight and a half US dollar cent. Um, the JPS Co in Jamaica has an average production cost of 18 to 19 US dollar cents. So you can see that it is a massive drop in, in energy pricing. And it also stands out compared to the LNG, right? So Jamaica is also transforming um, to the LNG um, and the PPA that is being in place with New Fortress is, is much higher than the PPA um, that, the, that JPS is paying for the energy generated by, by the solar source. And now with the ability to also integrate battery storage, uh, I think it is a really sustainable solution not just talking about the local job creation and, and, and tax paying um, capacity that you're creating with this solar park. Thank you so much. I'm sorry to put you on the spot, but I knew that you had all, all, all the answers. And, and this, this singular example of Paradise Park um, really brings home the point that um, Ambassador Black Lane made earlier. Um, there, there is a clear, clear economic case, a clear economic case um, in the small island developing states, despite their small size, it just requires um, um, partners who are willing to be flexible, to be innovative, to learn the unique characteristics of the um, um, island economies and ecosystem. But um, this really represents um, a shining example of what is possible if you have developers who are willing to um, invest their time and energy in really getting to understand the, um, the, the markets in the islands, be it those in the Caribbean, in the Pacific or, or elsewhere. But Martin, we will be calling on you in the future really to um, continue to, to um, show us and and guide us through this important period 
for the entire small island developing states. We um, will now hear um, another private sector developer perspective. Um, Alexandra Somstay um, from, um, she's the Vice President for European and International Affairs at um, Akuro Energy. Um, Alexandra, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Selvin. Um, Director General, Ambassadors, Special Advisor, colleagues, uh, many thanks for uh, inviting Aku to this um, to this webinar. It's our pleasure to to be with you, and um, I will try to um, to tell you um, our story uh, first. Then I will try to tell you that all the solutions are available, and I will try to to highlight um, the barriers uh, to our uh, implementation and rollout of uh, of solutions. So next slide, please. Um, so who are we? Uh, we're French, we're based in Paris, and uh, we are renewable energy uh, developer only. Um, and um, we actually focus and, and we start our development with uh, Ireland. And I must say that Ireland is our playground. And the reason for this, and it's important that I start with that, is because we are French. Um, the capacity of development in France was very limited by big competitors. So we had to go outside of the hexagon. And we started with a French island and France do have a lot of islands here and there. And um, then we became a kind of specialist uh, in island. And this is why I'm very happy to, uh, to be with you today. Next slide, please. Um, so as, as you know, and as Ambassador Black Lane explained, um, the islands are a very specific kind of territory. It's an environment under constraint. Um, first, uh, most of them must import fossil fuel to meet their energy needs. Um, there is an accessibility issue. Uh, there is a land scarcity issue that is uh, a, 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 an enormous challenge, especially when you speak about competition between agriculture and renewable energy production. Um, most of the islands suffer uh, extreme weather events, which force renewable energy developers to come up with specific and tailor-made solutions. And then, of course, you have a lack of connection to high networks power. So all in all, this makes the island case much more difficult, but also much more interesting. And actually, for us, it became our testing lab. So when Ambassador Black Lane said that she um, uh, was reluctant to have second-hand technology pushed out to Ireland. I must say that in our case, we actually develop our best technology in Ireland, and then we export them to uh, mainland. So it's it's a reverse effect because for us, um, uh, islands are the best perf perfect place to test uh, most of our innovative technologies. And I will drive you uh, through uh, our solution. So next slide, please. Um, can go to the next one. Can you? Yeah, the next one. Um, so um, let me first with two two example of uh, island where we've been working. Um, um, first, uh, La Réunion Island, where we started uh, to 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 work uh, more than ten years ago, and then the Dominican Republic, uh, where we uh, installed recently uh, fifty megawatts of uh, installed power, and these are um, two very different uh, landscape. And I will go to to next slide if you allow me. Um, so we have developed, and I will guide you through all of them, um, six kind of solutions. First, agri-energy, to tackle the uh, scarcity of land and the competition with agriculture. Second, storage. Third, uh, containerized solutions that we call GEM. Then uh, floating solar. Fifth, anticyclonic wind form. And then um, a specific uh, um, crowd uh, lending instrument uh, to put the citizens at the heart of the energy transition. Next slide, please. Let me start with agri-energy. So as I told you, as there is a, a land competition between renewable energy project and uh, agriculture. Uh, for us, it was just not acceptable to 
take out some lands and uh, actually uh, de facto uh, ruin all the efforts to produce uh, and to have local production of fruits, vegetables, or flowers, for instance, that can be an important market. So here you see on the very left hand side, uh, what we've done in the island of La Réunion. Um, so um, we have installed greenhouses and on the top of it, uh, we've put solar panels. So of course, uh, it is more expensive to do that because you need to build greenhouses that are uh, resistant to hurricanes. But on the other end, um, this leads to a double usage of the land. And the only thing we required from the farmers uh, to whom we were subrenting the land for one euro or one dollar, if you like it, uh, was to turn to organic agriculture. So that they, take, they could take the time they need, but they need to be organic at the end of the day. And then we got our remunerations through the electricity uh, generation that uh, we use on, on the top of these, uh, of these greenhouses. Next slide, please. So um, this show you in details uh, how it works. Um, in um, La Réunion, uh, we've been creating 300 uh, additional jobs, uh, which is not little. And I know Irina has been very focusing on uh, job creation thanks to, um, to renewable energy production. And uh, we equipped these uh, greenhouses uh, also with nine megawatt of uh, storage so as to balance uh, the electricity production that we were generating. And in this specific case, we have built this project within the vicinity of a jail, naming that uh, we have the, the farmers, actually the prisoners who are trained and then can become the trainer of the next generation. So this is all done in the vicinity of a jail. Next slide, please. Then my second point is about storage. So um, as you know, islands and microgrids are often disconnected from continental and large grid systems. So you have to install uh, storage capacity to create an independent energy system. And this is why Aku has been investing a lot uh, of uh, energy and uh, into uh, building uh, strong storage capacity that can be adapted to uh, any of our system. Next slide, please. Um, so, so far we have been installing more than 700 uh, megawatt of storage capacity uh, through all our hybrid projects. You can go to the next slide, please. And uh, we've been doing that uh, in the uh, French island, but also in the Pacific, in Tonga Island. We've uh, recently won uh, two tenders, also in New Caledonia. So this can be done anywhere, of course, and in due uh, intelligence with, uh, with the local stakeholders. Next slide, please. Then I wanted to um, show you um, another solution that is called um, uh, containerized solution. Uh, this is in Indonesia. Uh, there you have very, very frequent hurricanes or uh, strong weather events. And uh, we come in with container where you have um, plug-in uh, solar system that you can unroll. And in 24 hours, you can plug uh, this electricity uh, capacity production to the network or 20 battery. And in case of hurricane coming, you can unplug it in three hours. So this is a very um, um, flexible uh, system uh, that is uh, cyclone proof and that can actually tackle needs of uh, some uh, islands that are uh, on a very um, uh, frequent basis uh, submitted to, um, to storm or to extreme weather. So uh, next slide, please. So this is exactly how it looks. So you, in these containers, you have either solar or you have storage, but you can combine them all. In Indonesia, as I showed you, we had nine uh, solar gem together with one storage gem. Next slide, please. Then uh, in several islands, you also have um, floating, uh, floating parcels that are unused because it was uncavated uh, land. And uh, this is, uh, these are places where there is no biodiversity. So basically it's a lost place. And there you can install floating solar, 
Uh, we've done it in the south of France, but we've done it also in several islands. And um, our new uh, flagship project is actually in Martinique Island. So, uh, so even though um, uh, you have a lot of water all around the island, you have also water inside the island that could be used to produce uh, renewable energy. Next slide, please. Um, this is actually the, the picture of the, uh, in the Martinique Island. We can go to the next one. Then I wanted to stress that when you develop a wind farm in cyclonic areas, uh, you need to have um, a selection of high-tech turbines that guarantee the maximum output and resistance um, to, um, to the plant design and make sure that uh, you will actually resist to this hurricane. So this is what we've done in Pekasa in uh, Dominican Republic. So it requires a specific handset uh, for uh, project development, but this can be done. And uh, we firmly resist anyone who says that uh, wind power is not an option for this uh, specific island. Next slide, please. So again, another picture, next slide. So this is where I wanted to, to end my presentation. Um, Ambassador um, Black Lane said that uh, the greatest asset in the island is the people. And I couldn't agree more. And this is why we felt we had to develop uh, a specific tool uh, that is uh, called Aquacop. It's actually a crowd lending tool because we felt that we had to empower the local citizens to actually participate to the funding of the renewable energy project they have in their own island. And this gave actually a major incentive to all the deployment of our project in the, in the island because the citizens were empowered concern about what we were doing and they actually become a stakeholder in this uh, project. And uh, as we commit to stay over the long run because we never sell our project, they feel reassured in you know, putting sometimes 50, 60 euros and to invest into their own project and into the future uh, of uh, this uh, renewable energy project. So this is my last slide and I would like to end my presentation to say that all the solutions exist. As you can see, as project uh, developer, we can do it all. Uh, we have the technology, we're very happy to bring it. Now, I was questioned by Arena when preparing this conference about the barriers. And I must say that the barriers to development is actually the financing part. And again, um, Ambassador uh, Black Lane, <laughs> I'm sorry to quote her so much, it's not, a, it's not a female coalition, but she was very right in saying that um, seeds more than need more, more than just debts or loans, they need other uh, instruments. And um, a lot of institutions like ARENA or like the European Investment Banks are really willing to put in place financing instruments. But when you go to the nitty gritty of them, it's actually very difficult to unlock them. And since uh, we are hosted by ARENA, um, ACU had the uh, pleasure to uh, be nominated twice for the ADFD facility. But then to unlock it, you need the guarantee of the state. And most of the seeds just cannot afford to, go to give this guarantee to a private stakeholder. So you see when you arrive at the very, very end of, of a project, sometimes, because you are just a private developer, because you don't, you know, you are not the, uh, the the municipal or the regional collectivity, you cannot just unlock your financing. So I think it's important to empower those uh, those developers, the one coming from the private sector, with the capacity to do so. Because if you don't do so, you will have only the big ones, the ones that have deep pockets and that can finance their own project. You will not have people like us, that's for sure or you will have only um, projects that are run by states. And I'm sure that many stakeholders would be, private stakeholders would be willing to actually run some project. You, it doesn't have to be all run by the states. Uh, private developers can do it, but we need the right instruments to do it. I hope I was clear and I think I was 10 minutes. Thank you so much. You were extremely clear and thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Um, we will now get the perspective um, from the multilateral development banks. Um, a lot has been said on the role um, of the 
of the MDBs in supporting and facilitating this transition, um, in supporting the efforts of the small island developing states to mobilize resources. I would now invite Mr. Rohit, Rohit Kana, um, who is the ESMAP manager at the World Bank. Rohit, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador, and uh, I would like to thank very much uh, our colleagues uh, at IRENA for, for inviting me to speak. Um, I think uh, you know, many of the previous speakers have, have touched upon the issues very well, uh, and I think the fundamental point is that despite the immense potential in, in small island uh, developing states, uh, uh, renewable energy development is still uh, rather limited uh, by uh, by infrastructure capacity and end capital. Um, so let me, let me just start off very, just with a quick overview of, uh, of what the World Bank's uh, support has been. Uh, essentially, you know, our, our support has been a combination of uh, advisory services and analytical work with the uh, deployment of a range of, of, of financing instruments. Um, over the last few years, uh, we've been uh, very privileged to be able to um, mobilize um, uh, over $100 million in, in, in concessional financing um, for small island states, uh, $22 million uh, for, with grants from, from, from Denmark and Japan, uh, over $40 million in, in, in highly concessional loans and, and grants from Canada, uh, and, uh, and, and the balance from the climate investment funds uh, for projects in, in, in Maldives, Dominica, and, and St. Lucia. Um, I think uh, without any doubt, uh, uh, th 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 there is clearly a need for more, and I'll, I'll, I'll speak to that uh, uh, towards the end. Uh, I think what we've seen is that uh, even with these relatively uh, sort of relatively small amounts of concessional finance, the catalytic effect uh, is is quite significant. Uh, in in Tuvalu, um, the, the 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 grant of uh, of, of two million dollars, uh, combined with uh, World Bank financing, uh, has led to the the country's largest uh, solar PV and storage uh, facility, uh, and and you know the country is now headed to a twenty percent variable renewable energy penetration. And of course, as, as, as you pointed out yourself, Mr. Hart, a significant reduction in tariffs uh, because, uh, because uh, Tuvalu would now have to rely much less on imported uh, fossil fuels. Um, similarly, and, and the, the other thing that, that this funding is able to do is really more on, on sort of the, the analytical side, which is, um, for example, in the Pacific Island countries, uh, supporting the... Uh, the um, uh, the Pacific Power Association with renewable energy resource mapping so that now we have sort of uh, specific modules uh, for the global solar atlas and global wind atlas so that developers have a high level of confidence about the resource availability in, uh, in, in, in all the island uh, countries. Um, we uh, were able with this concessional money um, to prepare guidelines for variable renewable energy grid integration, um, which then led to, to uh, Micronesia's first commercial scale PV uh, and battery storage project um, of four megawatts. Um, and similarly in the Caribbean, uh, the work we've done there on, on distributed PV uh, in, for example, in St. Vincent the Grenadines and in Grenada, uh, those pilots have clearly demonstrated the economic and financial benefits at the commercial and industrial scale uh, for distributed PV. Um, so I, I, we really hope that these, uh, that these projects are, are, can lay the groundwork for significant private sector investments uh, in, in SIDS. Now, what I will say, though, is that uh, I think um, uh, a, lot of, a, a lot of colleagues on, on, on the panel today have, to, have talked about the barriers uh, to access to finance. Uh, and uh, one, uh, you know, one critical element for, for access to finance is the policy and regulatory environment. Um, and uh, as, as you might know, um, at the World Bank, uh, we, we produce every two years 
uh, what we call the RISE report, which is the regulatory indicators for sustainable energy. Um, and although, and, and in the most recent one that came out a few months ago, we were able to um, have a sample of the seven largest uh, small island developing states in that, in that report. Uh, and what that report showed is that there has been substantial improvement uh, in the rise scores for renewable energy in, in small island states, uh, but there is uh, still uh, quite some way to go. So this is an example. In, 20, in 2010, the average score uh, on a scale of 100, the average score for these uh, uh, SIDS was below 10. It, it is now 34. But just to give you an idea, 34 is still borderline uh, between what we call, uh, you know, poor to moderate. So there is, uh, you know, uh, clearly a need for significant uh, work from, from all development partners and governments and the private sector uh, to improve that. I would say, you know, that what we see a lot of progress is, um, uh, you know, half the countries now have competitive uh, auctions to procure large scale renewable energy. Um, Almost all the countries now have regulations that allow uh, small scale renewable energy producers to connect to the grid. Um, but I would say there are two areas in particular where there is the need to strengthen the enabling environment. Uh, the first is really to have the regulations for network connections uh, to conduct the studies for renewable energy grid integration to ensure that the grid flexibility is there now, the Jamaica and, 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 and uh, uh, the Dominican Republic are two countries that really have showed the way in this. Um, and, and, uh, and I think you know, others could really follow those examples. Um, the other area where there's a lack of regulation, uh, which, could, which, which if, if, if progress were made, could really boost the renewables agenda, is that for renewable energy for transport, cooling, and heating. Um, uh, of, of, the, of, sort of, of, of the sample of countries where only two have plans for renewable energy for transport. This is clearly a gap. Um, uh, and, and none, in fact, have any plans for renewable energy for heating and cooling. So countries you know, really could have plans and targets and send a clear signal to the private sector uh, that, they, that they are open to investment in these areas. Um, yeah, and then finally, I think the area where, where we see a real gap on, on the regulatory side is uh, very few countries have enforceable minimum energy performance standards and, and labeling systems. So these are areas I think that, you know, uh, that, uh, that if we work collectively together um, could, would definitely uh, attract uh, private, uh, private sector support. And I'll close out by, by, by talking about uh, sort of what the bank is now doing to, to address this. Um, so we have launched what we call the Sustainable Renewables Risk Mitigation Initiative, SRMI for short. Um, and, and the whole idea of SRMI is really to provide a comprehensive uh, package for countries for renewable energy development. And, and I think others have spoken about sort of the constraints in sovereign guarantees, and we absolutely agree with that. And that is why what SRMI tries to do is to reduce as much risk as possible uh, through uh, strengthening planning, better VRE integration studies, clearer targets for the private sector to, to know what the, what the direction of travel in the countries, uh, having robust procurement, addressing the critical public uh, sort of public investment needs and then really having guarantees for the residual risk and making sure that residual risk is as small as possible uh, by having sort of de-risked a more upstream. Um, and then blending with climate finance uh, to, to really address those risks. And most important of all, to really have a very strong focus on the socioeconomic benefits of renewable energy development. I think there has not been enough emphasis on the importance of human capital skills development on local development, i.e. for communities, um, the value chain, how local industry can participate um, and access in general. So really looking at, and, and I think resilience is another area of, of tremendous importance. Uh, and we've seen this all come together in the Maldives, uh, which is an example of how we see uh, sort of this comprehensive package uh, of support 
uh, resulting in, 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 a, in a hundred million dollars investment uh, uh, from the World Bank, from the climate investment funds, um, from the AIIB, and $40 million from the private sector coming in for a 36 megawatt uh, renewable energy. And as many of you know, Maldives has, has really uh, sort of set very ambitious targets and is, is making a tremendous effort, not on the electricity side, but on the, on, on the, on the on sort of the electrification of transport uh, through renewables. Um, so we, we've, you know, we're very pleased that uh, you know, we've been able to mobilize over $500 million from, from the GCF and, and the Climate Investment Funds for SRMI. Uh, but Maldives is the only country in, 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 that, in the SRMI initiative to date, and we really hope uh, that, uh, that, that colleagues uh, on, this, on this webinar today will, will consider um, uh, sort of the offer of the bank on SRMI for more SIDS to join. So with that, I will close and thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, Urot, for, for um, that excellent presentation. Um, and in particular on your, um, your, your really, really very targeted focus on the role of the MDBs using a very practical set of examples. Um, you made reference to the role of the MDBs in supporting um, SIDS in their risk mitigation strategies, um, building capacity, um, improving the regulatory and policy framework, as well as um, in their resource mobilization efforts. You also indicated that there um, were still many opportunities or the low hanging fruit um, in the transport, heating and cooling sectors, which could be explored by many of the small island developing states. So thank you so much. Um, and um, I really would encourage those who are on this call to take you up on that offer, um, um, really of the World Bank's um, continued um, support to this effort in the small island developing states. Colleagues, um, we will now move to a discussion on um, public and private collaboration and how this can accelerate green investment in SIDS. And, and we, we'll have some scenes set in from um, Ms. Raquel Moses. Raquel, it's a pleasure to see you after so many years, um, who is the CEO of the Caribbean Climate Smart Accelerator, who's had practical experience really in bringing this together from a, a bringing the public and the private sector um, and finance um, together in the Caribbean region. And Dr. Um, Kamlesh um, Dukaka, um, who is a research of, who is from the research office at the Mauritius Renewable um, Energy Agency, um, who will provide a different perspective um, uh, um, coming from Mauritius, of course, Mauritius shares many of these similarities and characteristics of other small island developing states. Um, um, I will invite um, Dr. Dukaka first um, to, um, to take the floor and followed after by Ms. Moses. Thank you. Uh, excellencies, organizers, participants, greetings from Mauritius. Let me first thank IRENA and the high level climate champions for the opportunity to share to contribute to this platform. So indeed many pertinent observations have been made by the previous speakers and many, many points mentioned uh, will be echoed in my following remarks. So early last year, the government of Mauritius in its five year program reaffirmed a renewable energy target of 35% by 2025 and set a target of 40% by 2030. The Renewable Energy Roadmap 2030 for the electricity sector, published by the Ministry of Energy and Public Utilities in August 2019, charts the way for these targets and estimates planned investments of nearly 700 million US dollars over the coming decade. One of our roles at the Mauritius Renewable Energy Agency, the MARENA, is to create this enabling environment for the development of renewable energy. The close collaboration between the public and the private sector is key to this process. 
The Mauritius electricity sector has decades of experience with private investment in electricity generation, with the independent power producers, the IPPs, accounting for nearly 55% of our electricity generation. Marena has been engaging with private stakeholders through holding of discussions, briefing sessions, and workshops for continuous exchange and ensuring proper dissemination of information. The earlier mentioned roadmap is currently being reviewed in the ongoing COVID-19 context. And the plan investment may vary due to the impacted industries. Our review exercise is essential to evaluate and estimate the amount of capital to be mobilized for Mauritius and devise new and appropriate strategies to meet these targets. Mauritius, as many small island developing states, depend on foreign expertise also for the implementation of our projects. And as such, consequential delays have also been noted due to the pandemic. There is also in parallel, to echo the word of capacity building earlier, both in public and private sectors to sustain this growth of renewable energy projects in Mauritius. Locally, government have introduced uh, tax in in incentives, both at the corporate and the individual levels for green investments. There are ongoing substantial public sector investments in energy related infrastructure to support the uptake of renewables. For example, upgrade of the current grid network and smart grids for the electric sector. And also in other end use sectors such as transport and heating. For example, on the e-mobility front, we are witnessing the implement implementation of the light rail project within the dense urban corridor on the island with 13 kilometers already operational and another 13 kilometers nearing completion. There are plans for the operating company to invest in photovoltaics so that the light rail is also powered by green electricity, electricity on the long run. A recent report on the 10 year electric vehicle integration roadmap for Mauritius considers the impact of electric vehicles on the grid and it will enable informed policy decisions. It is noteworthy that most to note that most of our public transport vehicles are owned by private companies in Mauritius. Thus, the collaboration is important in successfully ensuring the transition to e-mobility. One of the strengths of the private sector in Mauritius is that they organize themselves through several well-established structures and get their say in policy formulation. The role of local banks, both private and state-owned, is also critical. The Development Bank of Mauritius supports many schemes to empower small and medium enterprises and provides funding and grants for green activities. A program named SUNREF, Sustainable Use of Natural Resources and Energy Finance, which is funded by the AFD, the Agence Française de Développement, and the European Union, provides a dedicated credit line to partner banks, including privately owned ones, in, for on lending to the private sector. And this is to scale up investment in sustainable energy, climate change adaptation, and gender equality in the energy sector. So green investment opportunities are clearly present in the SIDS. They need to continue to get due attention from the global community through increased visibility of projects and opportunities, as well as through strategic networking and ongoing consultations like uh, through events like today. Small islands need to create and maintain the conducive environment for attracting such private efforts and funding to leverage the momentum created by the public sector measures and investments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I like that phrase that you use at the end. Um, the opportunities are present. The, the opportunities are present. There's um, a high level of political will and appetite in the small island developing states, be it Mauritius, um, islands in the Pacific, the Indian Ocean like the Maldives, or in the Caribbean. So thank you so much for those reflections. I now give the floor to Ms. Moses. Raquel, Hi, it's great yes. to see you. Great to see you as well and really glad to be here with all of you, especially as the protocols have been established. I'll just say there, there are really two things that I want to talk about this morning. Uh, the first one is, is the challenges that we face and some possible solutions and, and identify what in my view is the real enemy. So 
in Caribbean countries, uh, even when we're doing all of the right things, you have a storm like Hurricane Maria that comes and knocks out all of our, you know, 226% of GDP in the example of Dominica. So even if you are, you know, managing your infrastructure and you are um, making all of the right decisions, you're focused on education and crime and all the things that governments have to spend money on, there just isn't enough capacity to do that. Plus, to sustain the damage that takes place after a storm. We are in a region of disproportionate, not only disproportionate climate risk, but we also tend to attract a number of unscrupulous characters. So for every MPC there is that does a phenomenal job like that project in Jamaica, which I absolutely adore, um, there are a number of other characters who come in and our ability to weed out the good from the bad is time consuming and it slows things down. So I think one of the things that we need is absolutely as, and, and I, I'm not apologizing for quoting um, uh, Ambassador Black Blaine, you know, we need more philanthropy because we, can, we simply cannot take on more debt, but we also need more guarantees against the risk. And we need to use fewer sovereign guarantees and more solutions against needing to use sovereign guarantees. And what I loved about the, the MPC project especially was that it created an opportunity for, for locals to invest. And I think all projects need to have that requirement because how are we building capacity within countries to make sure that they are able to, we don't want to be saved, we want to be empowered. We want to create opportunities for ourselves. We want to build upon our strengths. We want to participate in this opportunity that is being created, this $17 billion opportunity to meet our Paris commitments by 2030. What we know as a challenge is that the ease of doing business in the region is, is not strong. And that is something that we absolutely need to take responsibility for and we need to build as well. But in addition to that, we also need support in building our capacity to build that ease of doing business, another role in which philanthropy and private sector support can play a part. You know, debt at the moment is, is the only stick that we have, and we have to move away from that. We have to innovate our way out of debt as that only tool. As a team, we are working on building a blended financial instrument, including uh, a member from IRENA on the team, and looking at different ways to fund specifically solar projects so that we have the ability to grow and to build upon projects. And what I'd like to see us do is export more of these solutions to the developed world, rather than always being the recipients of, of uh, developers coming in. Um, you know, things are moving very, very slow in the region, and that's one of the major challenges that we face. But likewise, some of the lending institutions and some of the gifting institutions and some of the granting institutions also uh, take too long. And so what we want to see is more leading by example in that in that realm where, you know, the Green Climate Fund, for example, and I wouldn't want to sort of call them out. I know they're doing phenomenal work, but, but the process takes really long. So the real enemy from my perspective isn't climate change. The real enemy is time. If we had unlimited amounts of time, we would be able to address all of these risks um, within a reasonable, we, with, with reason and with thought and with, with action. But the fact is we are running out of time and thus we have to start operating in parallel rather than taking a serial approach and we have to we have to take greater risks, but we also need support in being protected against those risks, so that we have the ability to make the bold moves that we are required, but that we are bringing private sector money in, and private sector is having an opportunity to do things that private sector does, which is create opportunities, and government creates policy, and we have that support to be able to do that. And like um, the real enemy, I have also run out of time. Thank you so much, Raquel, um, for your reflections as well. 
And thank you so much for all of the hard work that you are doing um, in the region. I, I remember when we met a couple of years ago, it, it seems just like yesterday, um, when you were um, starting um, in this new role, you had um, all of these brilliant um, um, ideas on how to um, upscale the pursuit of renewable energy um, and climate resilient development in the Caribbean. And I'm so happy that you've been able to put many of them in place. We still have a long way to go, as you correctly said, um, but um, we really need leaders like you um, in the Caribbean to continue to push governments, um, citizens and the private sector um, towards grasping the opportunities of uh, net zero climate resilient future. So thank you for all of your hard work. Um, before opening the floor um, to questions, and we have about 26 minutes or so left, um, I would like to turn um, the floor over to Ambassador Black Lane. Um, you, um, many of the presenters quoted your um, really great intervention. And, and, and I really would love your perspective as chair of AOSIS before we open the floor to other participants. So Diane, quickly, um, any quick reflections from you before we turn the floor over to other participants? So a um, couple of things that I, I you know, running out of time I didn't get to mention is that one of the ways many of our countries would, um, let me just put it this way, um, I'm glad that the World Bank is on the call. And the way that many of our countries are structuring our project is um, to meet what the World Bank would use as a AAA rating. Like the World Bank has to have AAA rating projects. The Caribbean Development Bank has to have AAA rating projects. And to achieve AAA rating, many of the countries put enabling environment in place, which more or less just um, pretty much um, establish a monopoly. Um, a monopolistic mm. situation. So it does not allow for diversification and competition in the energy market, even in our tiny little countries. So Salwin, you would have known, remember, and well, most of us would remember when cable and wireless had a monopoly on a communication in our region and they paid for cricket and they did all of that things. And then when the countries had wanted to diversify, they had to do it as a, they had to join together as CARICOM and take on a big company from the UK so that they wouldn't get a lawsuit. And they, if you go back to read all of those documents, they said that you're going to lose jobs and you're going to, you know, all the stuff that could go bad and so on. And, they, and, and it slowed down the transition. Now, the, the fast forward to today, we have three companies um, competing in that space where we only had one. We have how many jobs, how many opportunities created because communication has improved. A COVID-19 is here and people have switched to online. If cable and wireless was here, people would never be able to afford to do it. Can anybody on this call remember from the Caribbean when you're making, when you're in college and you call home, hi, how are you? Hang up, blah, you know, it's $10 just for that. And this is where we're at now with energy. We're in the exact same situation. And the issue here, Selwyn and everybody listening, if we would just change the enabling environment, the World Bank representative was right, to make energy, production and distribution competitive. I mean, we wouldn't even be having a climate change convention because everybody would invest in this space. The private sector will understand the, the rules of engagement. They would understand what the risk really are because it would be known and everybody um, would have it in place. But right now, the problem is that we have a, 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 an investment enabling environment for energy that is a triple A rating. And, um, and even in our space, we keep hearing from outside that you have to keep this up or else what? I mean, the world is going to come falling in, which never really does happen. But this creates doubt and it creates inertia. And, um, and we overstate the risk more than anything. I do um, some of the panelists that presented. The solutions are all there. The risks are pretty much known now. And there's no other reasons why we cannot move forward except so we can adjust our national enabling environment and stop creating these monopolistic situation, whether it was wind or the utility or with LNG, we have to change that. Um, excellent reflections. And believe me, I remember those days of cable and wireless where you picked up the phone and you, um, and it was just $10 just for making a call. 
Um, but there are tremendous opportunities um, um, in the sector for um, for the SIDS um, regions. And as Raquel said, um, we really need to capitalize on that $17 billion um, opportunity really to make this happen in our region. And we already have the, a good example, the case of Paradise Park. So let's um, open the floor. Um, I can't see the chat function. So can one of my colleagues from IRENA um, please indicate who is the first person requesting the floor? Okay, um, I don't see an indication um, of someone requesting, um, I don't see an indication of someone request, oh, um, Jian, um, please take the floor and you can ask your question. Hello, this, uh, can you hear me? Yes, please introduce yourself first and then um, pose your question. Yes, this is Gianni Canetta, uh, director and founder of Greening the Islands, is a, a partner of the Lighthouse Initiative. I'm, I'm glad uh, to, to be in this call uh, and uh, anyway, to be part of this initiative. Very interesting presentation and the private public uh, discussion and dialogue is very important, is our target. I've seen, um, of course, I was. Uh, um, uh, happy to listen the words of uh, the Raquel uh, Moses the, from the Caribbean Climate Smart uh, Accelerator when she said about empowering people and uh, create a link with the experience of Aqua in the crowdfunding anyway. So my question for Aqua is uh, uh, what has been the challenges uh, in, uh, in the crowdfunding? Because uh, I strongly believe that crowdfunding can be a very important instruments um, uh, to uh, anyway um, uh, reach funds uh, for an interesting project, but also to empower people. No, is participating in uh, the financing of uh, of a project. And uh, anyway, uh, uh, and my question for Aqua is also um, anyway how much this crowdfunding has been uh, engaging the local community, the local population uh, or investors anyway, um, in this uh, project. Selvin, may I reply? Yes, sure, sure. Raquel? Yeah. Thank you. Um, so um, regarding um, the, the crowdfunding, um, so um, it has been uh, very easy uh, to put in place. Um, it, the most difficult part was to get the uh, recognition by the bank's authority. But once this was done, uh, this was OK. Mm -hmm. Then we had to raise the sailing to, to be allowed to um, uh, land, uh, to raise until 8 million euros, because at the beginning we were limited and we had to raise the sailing. And actually, as soon as we put something on the market, so to say, um, it is um, overlanded uh, after two weeks. So it goes extremely fast. And the positive outcomes is that um, mayors in general, uh, are getting uh, very much empowered by this tool. And then they create an entire community about uh, this project and they start creating additional societal project about the renewable energy project that we are in the lead. And they add on, uh, let's say, a project for schools or project for, to, to provide uh, ag, uh, organic food to, to the canteens of some schools or to, for um, education for elderly people. Uh, all this kind of initiative because the citizens that were interested were identified and they were brought to the project. And what is also extremely interesting with this crowd lending platform is that it allows us to um, capture um, the interest um, of some communities. For instance, in Luxembourg, the second most important population is the citizens coming from Portugal. And these people, they do have a power of investment and they are extremely happy to invest in projects that are developed in Portugal. So we have cross uh, lending 
over Europe or from France to Africa, et cetera, et cetera. So it is also a very interesting way to uh, capture not only citizens that are living there, but citizens that are abroad and which to, let's say, pay back and encourage their native country. That's an interesting point, Alexandra. And I think um, just the point I was about to make about um, the World Bank did a study back in 2013 about the diaspora specific to the Caribbean's willingness to reinvest in the region. And at the time we were talking about energy projects, but what happened since then is that those structures around uh, crowdsourcing uh, investment at scale, that, that structure that has not been formalized in the Caribbean at least. And while there are small entrepreneurs who are uh, piloting little projects, we need to create something first at scale and second at a regional level, because the opportunity is not just for the diaspora to invest back in their home country, but to invest in, in countries across the region. And if we are going to create projects at scale, we really need to create a platform that has the ability to do that. And that's a key opportunity for the private sector. Thank you so much, Raquel. Um, Kamla, do, 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 do you also, um, is, is this something that you think will be, um, is also relevant for Mauritius and um, you, you, you um, or a small island developing states are also part of the African group um, and, and, and seeing it from both perspectives. Um, how, how, how do you see this playing out in Mauritius? Definitely, uh, the financial aspect is critical. Mauritius is aiming to, uh, I mean, ongoing work about positioning itself as a financial finance hub. And uh, as uh, recently as 10 days back, there has been a call for views on fintech. So the government is looking at uh, uh, easing uh, the uh, new financial instruments. We have the sandbox license uh, framework that is in place. So maybe we are creating that space for, for financing to come. Uh, we are aware that the stock exchange already also have in place a uh, framework for the green bonds. And we are waiting uh, uh, projects to come to be financed under that. And uh, to, to build on the point you mentioned about uh, Mauritius, I mean, when we looked at the maps on the presentation, the presentations earlier, we see that ecosystems around the Caribbean with a close proximity of the islands. But if we were to look at Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, this most uh, far away, the connection between the islands. Nevertheless, we have been able to use um, our connectivity with Africa and uh, Southern Africa through various uh, regional platforms uh, to, to, to leverage investment uh, and to, to, to create these financial flows. And um, uh, as from uh, the beginning of this year, we have this all uh, Africa uh, free trade um, platform that is on uh, kicked off under the, uh, under the ages of the African Union. So there are opportunities, uh, as Aqua mentioned earlier about islands being testbed. So they are not only technological testbed, but they can be financial testbeds that can uh, help uh, other uh, islands leapfrog. And one thing on the economic and finance side is the MRV, the measurement reporting and verification. Uh, I think uh, there might be a lot of things going on that uh, we also need to be able to report. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the indicators in the SDG seven. So in that area, also a lot of capacity building for the islands is important. Thank you so much. Um, I will now take our final question. Um, Olicia, um, I think I pronounced her name correctly. Um, you are our final question for the morning. Yes, thank you. Dear moderator, dear colleagues, of the participants of a special event of the International Renewable Energy Agency on Net Zero Investment Lab, Public and Private Sector Collaboration on Accelerating Green Investment in Small Island Developing States. 
dear guests and invitees. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in this event. My name is Alesia Vyacheslavovna Kachitkova. I have a scientific degree of the Candidate of Sciences in Economics from the St. Petersburg State University of Economics and Finance, Russian Federation. I thank the spokespersons for the presentations and I want to ask my core questions. Question for all speakers. The purpose of my first question is, which imprescriptible components, in your opinion, should incipient national mechanism for regulating the effectiveness of the innovative activities at the energy industrial enterprises level include? building on expanding the capabilities of the domestic manufacturing supply chain in small island developing states, increase the role of small and medium-sized manufacturers in advanced manufacturing, fostering the ecosystems of manufacturing innovation for driving dramatic cost reductions in critical clean energy technologies. Thank you for attention. And second question includes the following provisions. What aggregate of the carbon capture solutions and technologies will provide the achievement of the net zero CO2 emissions from the energy and industrial systems in small island developing states in order to rapidly increase the energy effectiveness combined with the rapid decarbonization of power and the gradual electrification of their economy? Thank you. Thank you so much. And, um, and colleagues, we have um, just 10 minutes left. Um, so I will give the floor to each of the participants um, to answer Olicia's question and also to deliver um, very quick um, closing remarks. Um, really, this has been a great session. Um, I will start first with um, Mr. Gunul, very quick one minute closing remarks. I don't know if he's still on the call. Um, I will now hand the floor over to Martin. And you have um, Gunul's one minute. So you have two minutes to. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Hart, again. I think, first of all, uh, we all understand that there are many cases where renewable energy has been successfully integrated and implemented uh, on small island uh, nations. So I think we can take these examples and try to, to really scale uh, the existing models um, with the different developers, with the different private sector organizations, uh, and, and really use the momentum um, to, to replicate what actually has been done uh, already, um, just on much larger scale. Um, whether crowdfunding is, is the right platform for that, or rather more regulated capital markets uh, or funds or, or other investment schemes, I think every island needs to find uh, their own uh, way to, to have the local community participate. That might be also other ways like credit unions, um, energy unions in that case to be created um, like Barbados uh, intends to do. With regards to the supply chain and the question uh, from the audience, um, I think giving the small ecosystem of these islands and the global manufacturing chain and the renewable energy sector, it is likely not to become a success story for, for local businesses and economies to, to try manufacture locally. Um, wind turbines uh, are heavy equipment, um, solar panels need mass utilization rates, and this is simply nothing that is achievable uh, on these islands. I think the islands should, should really focus on the, the local part of the business, maintenance, repairs, um, smaller local subcontractors that can work and maintain these renewable energy assets uh, locally, the construction business, I think these are really the jobs that, that will be part of the, of the local value chain, but likely not the manufacturing business. Thank you, Mr. Hardy. Thank you so much, Martin. 
Um, I'm not sure if Nigel is still on the call. If not, we will give the floor um, to Roik. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Hart. Um, but I, I just want to echo what what Martin said uh, on on uh, sort of a local sort of local development, and, and and I'd like to just refer the 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 question that we had earlier. That we 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 produced some guidelines. Um, uh, from our SRMI experience and how to maximize socioeconomic benefits, really looking at the issue of domestic value, i.e. job creation, skills development, um, and sort of what are the opportunities for enhancing local livelihoods. Um, and with a particular, I think, focus on, on looking at uh, women's employment uh, opportunities. Um, uh, and and they're definitely, as, as Martin said, there are opportunities uh, to do that. Um, the last point I would make is, uh, I think, an important point that uh, that uh, uh, was made earlier regarding the enabling environment, uh, and it is, I think, very important for for uh, governments in, in in small island developing states to think about what the future of the utilities are, is going to be. Um, uh, you know, we are moving towards a situation where. Uh, the energy sector is going to be decentralized, de digitalized, decarbonized, uh, and that means that sort of centralized power um, uh, generation plants with the utility at the center of it all may not be the future. Uh, and certainly we have to look at how to ensure that whatever utility is there is, is credit worthy, but uh, it is also a, a, an energy system that is almost certainly going to look very different. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important that we look at these, how these decentralized uh, renewable energy resources can be better utilized uh, with a different structure uh, and, and therefore different policies and regulations. And so I think this is an important area for all governments to be thinking about, uh, whether in SIDS or otherwise. Um, thank you again very much. Thank you so much, Roit. Um, I now give the floor to Alexandra. Well, um, thanks a lot. Uh, first, it was it was a pleasure to to be uh, able to speak about Ireland uh, because uh, it, it's our, at the core of our business, and uh, we feel there is so much to do. And um, the only thing I, I would like to 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 say and to insist on is that uh, private uh, developers are ready, are willing to go for it. Uh, we just need a simple enable, enabling framework and uh, financing tools that allow us just to do our business. That's it. Okay. Very simple, very succinct. Um, thank you so much, Alexandra. Um, I will now give the floor um, to Kamlish, followed by Raquel and then Ambassador Blackley. Yes, so to one of the previous questions about carbon capture, we have we, we shouldn't forget small island developing states by definition are islands with oceans around. So opportunities exist in oceans for carbon capture that should be further investigated. So that's one of the answer to the questions. Uh, we may be small, but we have lots of strengths. So I think the transformation is also from small island developing state to strong island developing states. Thank you. Thank you. Raquel? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the opportunities are before us. I think that this is as, as scary a time as this has been. It is also a really, really exciting time because we're now forced to make many of the decisions that we should have made prior to this time. So I'm excited and encouraged about the potential that lays ahead of us. But by the same token, I realize that it is not by accident that the changes that we want to see are going to happen. They're gonna happen by deliberate and, and concerted effort on our part. And so it's really, really important that we think about in everything that we do and everything that we implement and everything that we execute, how we empower people to participate in their own success. 
so that not only are we surviving this situation that we're in, but we're thriving our way out of it and we're bringing everybody along, whether it's women, whether it's the poor, whether it's Caribbean people, you know, whether it's a disenfranchised, but we are creating something that's better than we left and something that's bigger than we could have imagined. Thank you so much, Raquel, for those comments. Um, Ambassador Blacklin, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, thank you all for these comments. And I wanna make two um, final comments. I agree with Martin on the answer to the questions that were asked. Um, I know we hear a lot about manufacturing these systems in the countries. I don't think we should focus on that right now. Um, there's a lot of benefits, economic, um, entrepreneurial, financial, we know um, currency, all of those benefits are so amazing if we could just transition. So that should be enough for now for us. But on my final words, I would like to say two things on behalf, one on behalf of AOSIS and one on behalf of Antigua and Barbuda. So um, for AOSIS, we love to work with Irina. Um, AOSIS have, is um, transitioned to a new chair and we're thinking we're three years behind in our implementation. It starts for us to be, it's time for us to be in full implementation mode. And um, so when you were there when we were negotiating the tax for the Green Climate Fund, you were there when we were negotiating tax for the Jeff, you were there when we started the idea of direct access, diversifying how we access financing. And now we're arguing to diversify what type of instrument that we are going to be at, um, accessing. So you were there when all of this was done. And in all of that, we could hear the negativity. We could hear, no, that cannot happen. This will not work. And we got the pushback and we got, and every, uh, so, as a scientist myself, and my father was an electrical engineer, I knew technically that all of this was correct. And my father would say to me um, all the time, so when you and I working together and so on, he had died and gone, but he said to me um, very early in my life, um, he said, you know, solar is running, they're saying that solar cannot work on earth, but solar panels with batteries is running the entire space station of this whole world out in space. If the solar panel can survive in space, how can it not survive in an island? If the you know wind turbine can survive in a hurricane island? So all of these things were made up reasons why we could not transition. And so now that we know that these um, uh, made up reason to transition, now how can we implement it? What are the barriers? And the barriers is know-how. And AOSIS countries love to work with IRENA. It was the first organization that helped us to push the idea of distributive energy. The World Bank didn't want to do it. The, develop, the bilaterals didn't want to do it because we wanted to work with a, a credit worthy um, a utility, right? And, and that's, nothing is wrong with that. That's their business model and nothing is wrong with that. So I would like to thank Irina to help um, Antigua and Barbuda and other island states to get into implementation mode and jump ahead of this investment. We all know in the investment space, in the private sector space, I'm sure Martin and Alec Zandra will know the, early, the earlier you get into that space, the more likely that you will make a lot of money. Elon Musk and, and Tesla is testament to that. And so the, the quicker that us as islands invest and get into that space, the, the more that we can maintain our advantage as small economies. And that is something that we want to say. On behalf of Antigua and Barbuda, I would like to thank Irina for helping us with our fossil fuel phase out program and providing a guide. And I'm happy to say that the government is taking on some of the recommendations um, that was made. And what we are realizing in the transition is that if you transition 20% to 40%, you, you, don't achieve, you don't achieve any savings. If you have to either do 20% or 80%, there's no in between. Just no in between. And so when we did our assessment, and thanks to Irina for helping us do that. And so now I'm hoping that we can publish our, um, our targets. And we did consult the private sector, thanks to Irina as well. And then thanks for um, organizing events like this so we can speak directly to the private sector. So our sub-targets actually have sub-targets for different sector, for agriculture, for social sector, for investment by women. So we have all of those targets that we're going to be going after and meeting. And I thank Irina for putting us in, in contact with partners that are good. Um, one of the speakers, I don't remember her name, but she's right. We are weeding out the good and the bad and that takes time and that just adds to the risk. And Irina helps us to do that. So we want on behalf of going back to AOSIS, going back to AOSIS, 
Um, we are looking forward to working closely with Irina to help countries to transition, you know, um, reduce our transitional risk, understand what we're doing, and to make sure, absolutely sure, that um, in the past, when we had fossil fuel economy, many of our people were left behind as investors, as beneficiary. And this time, that is not going to happen. We're going to make sure that we push so that they all benefit and they all can become uh, part of this whole program of transitioning. We will not leave. We will not leave our assets stranded, and our people are our most valuable asset. Thank you. And thank you so much. Yes, we sat next to each other for many of the very difficult discussions um, over the years, and um, certainly uh, while we're wearing different hats at this moment, you definitely have my personal commitment, and 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 definitely the commitment of the United Nations to support um, the, the SIDS and the leadership of Antigua and Barbuda of the Alliance of Small Island Developing States. Um, before turning the floor over to um, um, Francesco La Camera, DG of IRENA, who has definitely been um, a leader on this issue for many decades, um, it is clear to me, it is extremely clear to me that um, there are significant opportunities um, for all of us in the international community if the small islands developing states, if small island developing states um, continue to assume a leadership role in the global push towards decentralized, digitized, decarbonized energy systems. Um, we have this amazing, um, Raquel calls it the $17 billion opportunity. I think that this needs to be one of the key deliverables for COP26. I'm sorry that Nigel Toppin, the COP26 um, champion, had to leave us. But I think collectively, with all of the colleagues who are present here today, who represent different perspectives from the private sector, from the MDBs, um, from the public sector, and many others who are part of this um, um, push to support small island developing states. This is a concrete deliverable that can land and should land at COP26. So you definitely have our full support really to, 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 to land this um, $17 billion um, opportunity on the clean energy transition um, for SIDS at COP26. Um, but no pressure on Irina Francesco, but the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Selvina. And uh, really thank you for to all the speakers. Uh, I think it's been a very interesting discussion, honestly. And, um, and we have been able, the speakers have been able to touch all the key aspects on the critical aspects of the, 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 the possibility to in, uh, invest in the, in the small island. But we have also listened to some very good example of companies that have been able to, to, to make business uh, there. And this is also encouraging. And I think also that we have to reflect that uh, as when we talk about Africa, it doesn't exist only one Africa. And when we talk about the islands, we are not talking about one island. So solutions may, may differ, depend on the circumstances. Uh, we have learned from Reut, the initiative of the, the World Bank in the risking that is one of the key aspects as related to the sovereign guarantee, because we have seen how uh, it's difficult to, to, to get this guarantee for many projects. Um, we came from this, the experience of the facility over the last seven years facility with the, the Abu Dhabi Fund for Development. We are building a new one, a more substantial one with, uh, with them that we will launch along the road to the high level dialogue in, uh, in, uh, in New York. And uh, we will try to, 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 to find a way to uh, make possible also for projects like project from private that may have difficulties to get the, the sovereign guarantee to find a way for them to have the guarantee they need to make the investment uh, going, going on. 
I don't want to be long because I, I should uh, just repeat what I will say. But there's one thing that I, I want to reaffirm here. And there's one point that has been made by, by the Yan, the ambassador. Uh, why the small islands have to transition when they are really contributing at most zero to the, the climate, uh, uh, climate change. The fact is that it's important that we don't look at the energy transition as a double track. We are the developed country can invest in clean energy, the clean energy system of the future. And the developing country may stuck in the old system, oil gas system to have the revenue that's allow them to, 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 to proceed. Because this will build the inequality inequality of the future. So the, the reason for leapfrogging is to making all working for the new world, because who is not working for the new world will be left behind in 10, 20 years. And this will be a dramatic mistake for the developed country. So also if they are not contributing uh, drastically or, or to the climate change, they have to go for the transition because their economy, the well-being of their people uh, ask them to do so. And uh, I think uh, for all the kind words about the, 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 the work of Arena, but I can ensure that we continue to work for this happening. My last comment is that uh, we are trying to work for a building compact uh, also around the seas. I have seen two, two young uh, entrepreneurs that are not with us to, today. There is Roy, there is other. Uh, I wish to, we wish to work for a computer for the seats. So please, if you have any ideas or any space where you see uh, useful uh, to work on Arena on presenting such comment for the small islands, we are really ready to work for you or find, uh, find a common uh, element for a compact to, to be presented in the occasion of the level dialogue in, uh, uh, in New York and also to present uh, our good experience in the occasion of the COP26. So remember that we are fully engaged in working with, uh, with you in all ways and means. So please come out with the idea and working together. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your continued leadership. Um, this is a really great session. Um, we, we, we have a lot of work to do as we head towards COP26. Um, as I said, I believe that this is a concrete deliverable that can land um, um, at COP26. We have the high level dialogue in, um, on energy, uh, on the margins of the UNGA in September this year, as well as many other intermediate milestones. So thank you colleagues. Um, and I look forward to working with all of you to ensure that we can, um, that the SIDS can assume this global leadership role in the transition to net zero. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all again.